On June 24, 2012, Mohamed Mursi was declared the winner of the Egyptian presidential election, barely scraping together a majority of the vote. For the first time in its 83-year-long history, the Jama'at al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Society of Muslim Brothers, also known as the Muslim Brotherhood, secured the highest political office in the land of their birth. Compared to its humble beginnings in the city of Ismailia in 1929, where Hassan al-Banna founded the organization under the pressure of six men that came to him declaring their allegiance, the Muslim Brotherhood of 2012 had expanded well beyond the borders of Egypt, impregnating most countries in the Middle East, and placed itself at the head of the heart of the Arab world. However, the Brotherhood's unprecedented success, the highest peak the organization has reached yet, was quickly followed by a low that they had never experienced before. On July 3rd, 2013, a little over a year after the Brotherhood gained the presidency, Fatah al-Sisi, the defense minister, led a coup to remove Morsi from his office, to arrest the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood, and to start a campaign of totally deconstructing the Brotherhood in Egypt. This rapid turn of events represents both the highest and the lowest point of the Muslim Brotherhood's history. And what we'll find is that the factors that led to the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood after the Egyptian Revolution are the same factors that led to the Brotherhood's downfall and, unsurprisingly, are the result of the many decades in which the Muslim Brotherhood acted as an often suppressed opposition group, which stands in direct contrast to the positions of power that they had gained after the Revolution. The first factor that led to the Brotherhood's rise and fall is the entrenched regime elements that remained in place after the overthrow of Mubarak, the former dictator of Egypt that was overthrown during the Egyptian revolution. It was these elements that paved the way for the Brotherhood's electoral victory by diminishing opportunities for new parties to establish themselves. But once the Brotherhood was in power, they stymied the effectiveness of the Brotherhood's policies, eventually leading the coup against them. The second factor is the highly centralized structure of the Brotherhood around a few conservative figures. This centralized structure allowed for the efficient mobilization of influence and resources in order to attain electoral victory after the revolution, but alienated the youth and reformist elements of the organization that did not agree with the conservative leadership. The third factor is the relative inexperience of the Brotherhood's leadership with regards to positions of power and governance due in large part to the Brotherhood's history as an opposition group. This lack of experience resulted in a period of poor policy decisions and political moves that resulted in a weak party vulnerable to a coup. However, before we can dive deep into the reasons that led to the Muslim Brotherhood's rise and fall, we need to first understand who it is we're exactly talking about. The Muslim Brotherhood, the world's largest Islamist organization, can trace back its humble origins to the Egyptian town of Ismailia, a small town on the banks of the Suez Canal, where a local teacher, Hassan al-Banna, started to preach against foreign influence in the Muslim world and the need to revitalize Islam as a source of strength for Muslims. Al-Banna's ideas spread throughout his local community and eventually throughout the whole of Egypt, in the process developing an organization centered around Muslim Brotherhood, hence the name. The Muslim Brotherhood founded many social institutions, like schools and hospitals, and quickly gained influence on the national stage due to its populist message and its background as a provider of social services that the government often failed to provide. As the numbers and influence of the Brotherhood grew, so too did their attempts to influence politics. As Egypt was under British control at the time, Egyptian political independence was marginal and dominated by the monarchy that the British kept in power. Nonetheless, the Brotherhood tried to use their power to push for anti-British policies, often failing, but gaining the ire of the British as well as the love of the people in the process, leading to suppression that would characterize the Brotherhood's history. After the Second World War and the British Empire's decolonization policies, the Muslim Brotherhood took part in the coup d'etat led by the Free Officers Movement to abolish the monarchy and to establish a republic. However, the leader of the Free Officers Movement, Gamal Abdel Nasser, quickly turned on the Muslim Brotherhood after an attempt on his life, which he blamed the Brotherhood for. The Muslim Brotherhood's leadership was arrested, their organization declared illegal, and the entire movement moved underground, losing almost all of their influence in Egypt in the process. Fast forward a couple of decades to the 1970s when Anwar Sadat, Kamal Abdel Nasser's successor, opened up the political system in Egypt and decriminalized the Brotherhood, leading to a resurgence of strength and influence that no one had expected. 
the Brotherhood quickly became a major player on the national field once again, but maintained an apolitical stance in order to avoid any political persecution that may occur if they attempted to meddle in politics. In 1981, Anwar Sadat was assassinated, and Husni Mubarak gained the mantle of Egyptian dictator. Mubarak's reign started with a period of mutual toleration with the Brotherhood. Mubarak diffused the political tensions that had built up during Sadat's reign by releasing members of the opposition and press that his predecessor had imprisoned shortly before his death. Although this transfer of power occurred 30 years before the events of the Egyptian revolution in 2011, Mubarak already started to plant the seeds for the tree that would ultimately lead to his downfall. Mubarak continued Sadat's openness policies, opening the economic field for private actors and liberalizing the political arena. The Muslim Brotherhood, further renewed thanks to the liberalization policies of Mubarak, positioned themselves to once again participate in formal politics. Mubarak's decision to continue Sadat's economic policies alongside political liberalization provided numerous gaps for the Brotherhood to fill. The Brotherhood followed a strategy of infiltrating the political institutions which the regime had lost control over. They engaged with student unions, clinics, welfare institutions, and professional syndicates, the most notable of which was the professional associations of lawyers, doctors, and engineers. The movements into these specific institutions were not random or coincidental. In order to understand this, a step must be taken back in order to examine the Brotherhood briefly under Sadat's reign. Sadat brought an end to Nasser's massively oppressive policies toward the Brotherhood, inaugurated in 1971 when the first wave of Muslim brothers were released from prison. The leaders that emerged from these prisons found themselves in a new cultural context that was both alien and strangely familiar. Furthermore, they found a society in which the Brotherhood practically speaking did not exist and was, instead, dominated by a plethora of new organizations espousing spirituality and religiosity. By the end of the decade, the Muslim Brotherhood was able to rebuild itself in all its former glory, due in large part to the ability of the senior leadership to assimilate the Islamic student movements within Egypt into the ranks of a newly developed Muslim Brotherhood. Building upon this new source of wealth in the youth, the Brotherhood was able to start a multi-decade long campaign of a war of position against the Mubarak regime, which continued until Mubarak's overthrow in 2011. As was mentioned in the introduction to this video, the Egyptian revolution that overthrew Mubarak led to the election of the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate, Mohamed Mursi, as the president of Egypt. For many reasons, Mursi's reign was riddled with internal strife and problems, leading to his eventual overthrow and execution at the hands of Fatah al-Sisi, who instated himself as Egypt's de facto dictator. To spend nearly a century to finally achieve the position of highest power in Egypt, only to lose it all in a single year is obviously quite catastrophic, and it pushed the Muslim Brotherhood back to square one thanks in large part to al-Sisi's political oppression. Nonetheless, the entire chain of events, from the Muslim Brotherhood's rise to their fall, provides an excellent situation to analyze and gleam some pearls of knowledge that may allow us to, by extent, understand other similar such events, whether they've already occurred or will occur in the future. If you're liking the video, make sure to click the like button, to subscribe, and to leave a comment letting me know what you think about the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood's war of position against Mubarak's regime developed the organization in such a manner that it was perfectly placed by 2011 to mobilize all of its influence and resources to back the Egyptian revolution, which the organization's leadership did reluctantly. And, more importantly, the Brotherhood positioned itself to benefit the most from Mubarak's overthrow. The institutional structure of Mubarak's authoritarian regime provided a setting for the Brotherhood to operate in the shadows, gaining a large popular base and legitimacy in the eyes of the people while, for the most part, avoiding the political realm due to the nature of authoritarian politics. It was this environment, practically designed by the Mubarak regime, that laid the foundation for the meteoric rise of the Brotherhood during the Egyptian Revolution. This war of positions consisted of two major theaters, the social welfare institutions and the professional syndicates. It is important to note here that the war that was ongoing consisted of a constant back and forth between the Brotherhood and the regime. As Brotherhood power expanded, the regime would increase restrictions and repression in order to keep the Brotherhood in check. However, after the initiation of these restrictive policies, the regime would often, 
either for internal reasons or from Western pressure, re-liberalized the political and institutional spheres, opening up the path yet again for the Brotherhood to insert themselves. This was the cycle one finds up until the Egyptian Revolution. Following the adoption of openness policies and the public sphere's withdrawal from social welfare programs, the Egyptian government failed to provide an adequate healthcare system for the people, and when such services did exist, people generally couldn't afford them. The regime's inability to provide social welfare provided the Brotherhood an opportunity to engage the regime on a new front. Filling in the gap left by the regime, the Brotherhood opened numerous healthcare clinics all over the country. The Brotherhood's healthcare clinics were supplied with the latest equipment and staffed with dozens of volunteer physicians, providing better quality healthcare than the state at a lower cost, thanks in large part to the Brotherhood's reliance on zakat, Islam's mandatory almsgiving, charity, and their own Islamic banking institutions. The Brotherhood's actions in this realm allowed for it to expand its base of followers as certain segments of the population increasingly saw the Brotherhood as a viable alternative. And, even if not gaining the following of people, the Brotherhood earned legitimacy in their eyes as a provider of necessary services often superior to those provided by the regime. One of the aspects of Mubarak's political liberalization was the relaxation of restrictions surrounding the professional syndicates. This allowed for the Brotherhood to initiate a campaign of infiltration in order to enter these organizations and gain control of them through internal elections. As soon as the Brotherhood was able to resume its activities in the 80s, it started to engage in the most influential syndicates, such as the syndicates representing doctors, engineers, pharmacists, and lawyers. The regime was willing to cede the control of the syndicates to the Brotherhood, primarily due to the regime's belief that the professional organizations could be traded to the Brotherhood in exchange for less parliamentary activity by the Brotherhood. In essence, it was a calculated strategic decision and a line of reasoning that similarly applied to the case of social welfare institutions. However, the Brotherhood's subsequent resounding successes were not predicted, which ended up making the trade unfavorable for the regime after the fact. This success is explained by the Brotherhood's ability to introduce transparency to the unions it engaged in, their ability to block political infighting, and the Brotherhood's success in ending corruption and mismanagement within those organizations. In the end, allowing the syndicates to fall under the Brotherhood further strengthened the grassroots elements of the organization, providing its strong ties to previously state-controlled institutions, and further expanded the Brotherhood's base of power. When considering events closer to the Brotherhood's presidential election, one can see that entrenched regime elements in the form of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces that led the transition from dictatorship to democracy played a major role in clearing the field of opponents for the Brotherhood due to the Supreme Council's desire to block a genuine democratic transition which could jeopardize its economic interests and bring into power an anti-Western government. The Supreme Council implemented a number of changes to slow down revolutionary elements in society. First, when the Supreme Council formed a committee to inspect and introduce amendments to the 1971 Constitution, the Supreme Council placed Islamists in favorable positions to act as conservative forces that naturally avoided any revolutionary demands. Second, they implemented several policies that slowed down or weakened potential new parties, such as regulations around forming new parties and establishing a new electoral system that heavily benefited existing political parties. These policies almost ensured a brotherhood victory in the parliament and then, later, in the presidential election. Having examined the ways in which entrenched regime elements aided in the rise of the brotherhood, our attention will now turn towards its hands in the brotherhood's downfall. Entrenched regime elements played this role mainly in two ways. First, the media was used to the detriment of the brotherhood. Second, Regime elements within the military and within several government ministries actively worked against the Brotherhood and its leadership, provoking them to take drastic action which the Egyptian population saw as a return to the authoritarian past. Looking at the two most circulated private newspapers in Egypt, Al-Masri al, al yawm the Egyptian Today, and Al-Watan, the homeland, commonly estimated to sell about 150,000 daily copies each we can see that they dominate access to high-profile official sources and information. And we can also observe that the newspapers' editors and investors were closely related to the Mubarak government. Essentially, even after the Egyptian revolution, due to the decades of previous authoritarian rule, newspapers and other media sources were heavily tied to entrenched regime elements. 
In an effort to maintain their privileged status, position, and wealth, the owners and editors of the newspapers found it in their best interest to adopt anti-brotherhood positions. Important to note is also the numerous conspiracy theories that spread throughout traditional and non-traditional media that depicted the Brotherhood as acting as agents of either the West or the Deep State. Many of the most poisonous accusations leveled against Morsi concerned the alleged relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and the West. Stories were spread that Morsi had been elected to power mainly because of pressure and interference from the United States. Although most, if not all of these stories were false, they serve their purpose of spreading the seeds of distrust among the population. All of this shows that, during the Brotherhood's reign, entrenched regime elements were actively working to chip away and degrade the legitimacy of the Brotherhood in the eyes of the public through the media, who had very clear and strong ties with the regime. The other manner in which the entrenched regime led to the downfall of the Brotherhood was from within the government itself. As they continued to dominate the military, the judiciary, and several ministries, except for a few that the Brotherhood were able to gain control over, such as the Ministry of Agriculture. This could be seen when the Constitutional Court declared that one-third of the parliamentary seats were deemed unconstitutional, and subsequently dissolved the Parliament. In fact, it was the military that had engineered the dissolution of this first Brotherhood-dominated Parliament, in the process reducing the President's power. Further efforts were made within the ministries themselves to weaken and oppose the Brotherhood's policies and selection of individuals to lead or manage said ministries. The military also struggled against the Brotherhood's control, which led to Morsi in an attempt to assert his authority, challenging the military by transferring the powers of the generals as well as legislative authority to the presidency. The internal resistance of the entrenched regime elements eventually forced Mursi to adopt more authoritarian practices, greatly tainting his administration in the eyes of the populace, who were expecting greater freedoms and democracy and not a return to the past. This pushed the public to restart protests, which eventually led to the 2013 coup led by the military. The previously mentioned War of Positions shaped the Brotherhood in such a manner that, during the especially repressive periods of Mubarak's reign, the internal structure of the organization increasingly consolidated around a few conservative leaders characterized by their business ties and wealth, who were able to provide for the Brotherhood during periods where funding was scarce. This consolidation around a few leaders, along with the organization's long history as a highly hierarchical structure, made it such that the mobilization of people and resources was extremely easy and efficient for the Brotherhood. Compared to all the other organizations and parties in Egypt, whether they be Islamist or not, the Brotherhood was the best organized force among Egypt's political actors, even after the regime's numerous targeted attacks against them. With the onset of the revolution, the Brotherhood's leadership was hesitant to partake, both for strategic and historical reasons. Once it became obvious that the Mubarak regime was destined to fall, the leadership mobilized their forces to partake in the revolution. At the same time, in an attempt to cover all bases, the leadership of the Brotherhood was engaging in talks with the regime, offering to help contain the demonstrations in exchange for an enhancement of their own status. Having examined these developments, we find that the Brotherhood's rise can be explained by its organizational cohesiveness and its willingness to break with more radical revolutionaries to make early compromises with old regime power centers. Both of these connect to the highly centralized structure of the Brotherhood, where the strict hierarchical structure allowed for such cohesiveness to exist, and the consolidation of power around the few conservative leaders allowed for the organization to remain unswayed by revolutionary elements, focusing instead on pragmatic and strategic decisions, which, in hindsight, ended up becoming a double-edged sword. The leadership's conservative, strategic, and pragmatic attitude alienated significant groups within the Brotherhood, primarily the youth, who had feelings of solidarity with the revolutionaries, and the reformist elements within the Brotherhood, who did not agree with the policies of the conservative leadership. When the protests against the regime took place in Tahrir Square over the trials of members of the regime, the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood chose not to join in, remaining skeptical. Hundreds of the Muslim Brotherhood's youth, however, decided to participate anyways. This divergence in attitude between youth and reformist elements on one hand, and conservative elements on the other, eventually reached a point where many in the former chose to leave the organization and start new ones. 
These new parties and organizations were ultimately unable to achieve anything material due to the restrictions placed by the Supreme Council, yet their presence and siphoning of members and materials weakened the Brotherhood, making the organization more homogenous in its conservatism. While conservatism helped the Brotherhood broaden its base by appealing to the lower and lower middle classes, particularly during the Mubarak era, it became a burden after the uprising, weakening the organization and alienating it from all of the other political actors present, making the Brotherhood extremely vulnerable to the coup that finally occurred. Furthermore, the conservative and centralized nature of the organization made it such that any flexibility or adaptability that could have aided the organization was not present. The Brotherhood failed to make any efforts to appease the masses, such as adopting a revolutionary agenda or being more inclusive in its governance, directly due to the fact that the leadership of the Brotherhood had no desire to do so, and the other elements of the organization lacked any power to change the course decided upon by the leadership. The Brotherhood's leadership and its attitudes towards the youth and reformers stands in stark contrast to the Brotherhood of the past during Anwar Sadat's reign, building off of a new generation of youth activists, reconstituting its internal structures, as well as the demographics of its followers and leadership. This time period is especially important as it laid the foundation for Brotherhood success for nearly four decades. Successes that seem especially large compared to the Brotherhood's fleeting victory after the revolution. It was this capturing of youth elements after the Egyptian revolution that the Brotherhood's leadership failed to do, which cost the Brotherhood greatly in the form of its near total destruction. The inexperience of the Brotherhood leadership arises primarily from the organization's history and the manner of its internal institutions such that priority was placed for loyalty rather than merit. Decades of repression and exclusion from political institutions gave the leadership very little opportunity to develop or hone the skills necessary to govern a country. During the three decades prior to their election, the Brotherhood had no access to public office and its leaders and members were systemically barred from holding ministerial and senior governmental positions. This inexperience is further perpetuated by the fact that, within the Brotherhood itself, in the decades building up to the revolution, loyalty was placed over merit or experience. This resulted from both the centralized structure of the Brotherhood, with the leadership having the absolute power to appoint their desired candidates, and the war of position against the regime, which necessitated that the Brotherhood rely on loyal members. These characteristics allowed for the rise of the Brotherhood in one specific manner. Initially, during the Egyptian Revolution, the Brotherhood made the promise of withholding from the parliamentary and presidential elections. Significant elements within the Brotherhood were aware that whoever succeeded Mubarak's regime was destined to fail, as the populace desired swift results and the state had been left in such a drastic position that such reforms and changes would be nearly impossible. Whoever received the mantle would attempt to fix the dire conditions of Egypt, but would ultimately fail as the task was far too grand, especially when considering the expectations of the people. However, this line of reasoning did not convince all groups within the Brotherhood, the most important of which being the Brotherhood's leadership. Seeing a great political opportunity in front of them, they chose to take it, eventually leading to the Brotherhood winning the majority of the seats in the newly elected parliament, as well as gaining the presidency. The inexperience that inclined them to push for political power is the same inexperience that eventually led to their dramatic fall. With little experience concerning policies and their implementation, the Brotherhood made several mistakes that alienated other actors in society, providing a platform for the entrenched regime to justify a coup and tarnish the legitimacy and reputation of the Brotherhood in the eyes of the common people. We will examine two specific cases here, the Brotherhood's economic policies and the Brotherhood's inability to form a public image as revolutionary rather than more of the past. In the economic realm, the Brotherhood adopted the neoliberal economic policies of the Mubarak regime, continuing them even though they were the same policies that decreased the quality of life for millions of Egyptians and caused mass discontent. Despite the Brotherhood being made up of mostly low and middle class individuals who preferred more socialist and leftist policies in the field of economics, the Brotherhood adopted a market oriented vision. Maintaining this divergence between their constituency and their economic policies burdened the movement and affected its popularity. 
This adoption of neoliberal policies ties back to the centralization of the Brotherhood around businessmen and tycoons, who preferred such policies and were unwilling to give them up, even in the face of mass discontent. With regards to the general population, which expected revolutionary changes, not a seeming return to authoritarianism, the Brotherhood failed to provide anything in the way of appeasement. Instead, the Brotherhood continued with its own Islamist project, which was not necessarily rejected by the population, but failed to meet their revolutionary demands due to its inability to incorporate the new post-Arab Spring ideas into its ideology or to demonstrate real progress in securing Egypt's interests. The Brotherhood's inability to deliver on its promises, to do away with authoritarianism, to put Egypt on a path towards democracy, or to implement a program of social justice, eventually led to vast segments of the population returning to the streets. Ultimately, it becomes apparent that the Brotherhood's general inexperience with governance led to an environment where entrenched regime elements could justify a coup with little to no repercussions. Had the Brotherhood been more successful in policy implementation and in its public relations, the vulnerabilities exposed by the coup participants would have been harder to exploit or not existed at all. Having considered the factors that led to the rise and fall of the Brotherhood after the Egyptian Revolution, one finds that the rise was only able to occur due to decades of maneuvering and foundation building by the Brotherhood. However, the characteristics that were instilled in the Brotherhood made it such that, once power was achieved, the Brotherhood was unable to hold on to it for long. These characteristics, developed in order to survive in an environment dominated by an authoritarian regime, made it such that the events of the Egyptian revolution and its end, marked by el-Sisi's coup, were almost inevitable. The continued presence of entrenched regime elements, the centralized nature of the Brotherhood's structure around conservative leaders, and the inexperience of those leaders regarding political matters, all acted as the nails to the coffin of the Egyptian revolution, which the Brotherhood ended up inheriting when it was elected to the presidency with the expectations of revolutionary change, which it failed to provide. Looking back at the revolution, I can only really identify one moment that may have truly brought about a real revolution, in the process of avoiding the blunders of the Brotherhood and the return to authoritarianism under Sisi. That moment was when the protesters and revolutionaries allowed for the Supreme Council to overthrow Mubarak and instead placed themselves as the ruling power. This transition was not of power, but of skin. The elements underneath the skin remained the same. All that changed was the symbolic figurehead at the top, that being Mubarak. By not completely removing all of the regime elements in the government, the revolution was destined for failure. Entrenched regime elements continued to wield significant power in the military, judiciary, and several other ministries such that the Brotherhood was not truly in power. Furthermore, it becomes obvious that the Supreme Council used its positions of power to stall the progress and change that was being called for by the revolutionaries, ensuring that conservative organizations such as the Brotherhood dominated the discourse and revolutionary parties had a difficult time being founded and mobilized. By the time protesters returned to the streets in 2013, it was too late. The deep state had ensured its own victory. Had the protesters and revolutionaries continued, even after Mubarak was overthrown, and had successfully overthrown the Supreme Council, the chance for a true revolution, which would have upturned the existing institutions in Egypt, in the process burning away 60 years of authoritarian buildup, was high. Now, over nine years after the coup, one finds an Egypt that appears as if the events of the Egyptian revolution did not occur. The only difference has been the near total annihilation of the Muslim Brotherhood. If history is any guide, however, one can reasonably expect that the Muslim Brotherhood will rise up again, as it has in the past, and protesters will eventually return to the streets in the face of economic stagnation, lack of opportunities, and the failure of the regime to fix these problems. Should another revolution occur again in the future, hopefully the Egyptians will learn from the events of 2011 and conduct a true revolution, burning the existing institutions to the ground and rebuilding anew from its ashes. In this case as well, if history is any guide, such a process would be extremely destabilizing, if not bloody, for both the state and society. However, if change is demanded, and it almost definitely will be again, such is the process that is necessary if gradual change within the system does not occur. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to click the like button, subscribe, and check out my previous video on the reasons for the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Thanks.